It's January the 21st, 2023, and this is The Future of Photography. The Future of Photography. Back with another episode, back with the whole crew. Hi, Adrian. Hi, Jeremiah. How's everyone Greetings. doing? Greetings. Hello. Uh, very well, thank you. Yes. <laughs> Still life. Still life. Today's still episode life. is about still life of all things. So I did some research. Okay, just to just to get us into this episode. Still life. Uh, Wikipedia says a still life is a work of art depicting mostly inanimate subject matter, typically commonplace objects which are either natural or man-made. And uh, the, I think the the peak of oh, what, by the uh, way, that's all object. I, yes, yes, and, and we we will look at pictures. So this is a video episode for sure, and uh, we all uh, submitted some pictures. So we'll go through those later. And um, uh, I can already say we have different interpretations of what still life is. I think uh, Jeremiah is the one who took it most literal, as in the way still life used to be um, when at the at the sixteenth century, seventeenth century. So we. Um, we're going to look at different kinds of still lives, and uh, I did some research. So, the one thing I found out throughout my uh, well research, reading Wikipedia, <laughs> pretty much, um, <laughs> and uh, the one thing I found out is that there there used to be a hierarchy of genres. Okay, so but different. When? When? Uh, well, well, sixteenth, uh, seventeenth, eighteenth century, there was this hierarchy, and then I think it went out out the window around the 19th century that's what they say here and it's uh, it's pretty much um a formalization of the different well kinds of painting and one well can so we guess? Can well we guess? the question the first question i have for you is can you guess what rung of the letter still life got i'm going to say top of the top of the list would be religious paintings Second would be portraitures, generally portraiture of royals. Um, third would be historical battles. And fifth, fourth or fifth would be still life. So you, you uh, um, uh, when you started saying your list, I thought you were reading this from Wikipedia because no, no. the his, historic, well, historic and <laughs> religious and mythological and allegorical subjects are all all on the top, really um, way on the top. Followed by portrait painting, uh -huh. followed by the genre painting or scenes of everyday life, uh, followed followed by landscapes and cityscapes. Um, here's a quote by Samuel van Hoogstraten, who called the landscape and cityscape painters common footmen in the army of art. Um, <laughs> that sounds inspiring. <laughs> followed, followed by animal paintings. What? And the lowest, the lowest rung of the ladder is for still life. Uh -huh. I so found this... elevate it now. Well, maybe we will. I I found it really interesting because if you look at the development of um, of photographers, new photographers will typically start out with shooting pictures of things, things that are patient, that don't frown at you when you take your time and set no things up rolling. and so on. No, no eye rolling. No, yeah, I'm getting bored here. Um, so the still life is, is is kind of in the development of photography skills is fairly early in that process. It was for me, and I've seen it with so many people. So, what's so special about the still life? So that put, puts Ansel Adams quite a way like, down the ladder, doesn't it? I mean, yeah, all he did was take pictures of the occasional mountain, <laughs> <laughs> which again, landscapes landscapes were two rungs up in that hierarchy. So the, the landscapes are. <laughs> I, and I think I think inanimate is one of the one of the criteria, kind of the formal criteria. Uh, landscapes, there's rivers, there's wind, there's motion. So where 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 on that ladder is like shooting gas stations with cine still? <laughs> <laughs> landscapes. Is it is it a current gas station or is it uh, is it a museum a gas station in a museum that's not in use? <laughs> I don't know. I, I have no idea. I'm just or is it a model of a gas station on a tabletop. 
Yeah, yeah. So it's, it, I, I think we don't have a clear cut delineation of where the genre starts and where it ends. But that's kind I, I of the historic mean, definition. Yeah, I mean, I would say that, you know, for painter students, when you think about it, um, they're not going to get a model. They d probably don't have the technique to do an imaginary, religious, neo, you know, mythological uh, work right off the bat. And it's probably a very good place to just sit and study how light falls on, you know, a petal of a flower, you know, uh, that kind of thing, a bottle, um, w you know, a, a, a little water spill on a table, you know, what does that mean? It's kind of pre-ray tracing, so it really encouraged people to look hard and then make choices about what paint, how to mix the paint, what color, what density. So, so still life is, is often used in, in exercise. In well, photo photographic exercise, artistic exercise. I, I would imagine it is, but I think that diminishes the genre. Because while yes. the genre may be hierarchically down, you know, certainly in the top ten. So um, we have to imagine how many still lives have been created by how many artists over the last 500 years. Oh, some of the most famous paintings are still lives, yeah. Yes, they are. And so what makes something last, um, elevate beyond the mediocre into what will become a trope, which of course is the nature of my current exploration of still lives, is, is what are the tropes of still lives and how to kind of reimagine them or take them apart or, or point at them. Um, but what I do find is that, uh, you know, besides the, the irony of capturing still lives and, um, you know, the, the, the choice of materials to photograph, I, I would say that it is a fantastic place to understand things like photogrammetry, photogrammetry um, the, the surface of objects, uh, it's also great for the the translucency of mm -hmm. of uh, common objects. Uh, the um, you know the transparency. I said the translucency. I said the reflectivity. Um, a refraction. All of yeah, refraction. So all of that in a you know the world in a grain of sand, etc. It really forces someone in a quiet place, controlled light. Uh, more or less, whether it's window light somewhat or artificial light, to slow the process down and look really hard at all of the minutia of the subject. When you're doing a human, they're going to go like, come on, I got to get a coffee now. <laughs> I got to get out of here. It's like, what's taking so long? Just shoot, <laughs> right? One more, one more. No. You don't get that from inanimate objects. And, and, and so I think it provokes a discipline with, with which you can carry into the real world with an understanding of light and subject. And I think that ties it really nicely into current art because we, 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 we're, we're pretty much spanning several centuries here. And uh, th those, those properties of light, of objects of um, colors, of reflections, of bouncing light around, uh, of, of, of composing a picture and putting things in relation to each other on a surface. Um, that, that is as relevant today as it was 500 years ago. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, how about we just bring up some of the photos here? Uh, let me da, 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 T4. And I distinguish browser. this from tabletop photography, by the way. <laughs> which which is more of a of a um, let's say commercial advertising focused um, yeah. kind of photography, right? 
So, so jump, jump, jump in. I'll tell you what, Chris, this this is a photo that I put in our shared thing, but this is a photo I put in our shared folder to just because you guys had asked what my new camera was shooting. So the ones that are actually the still oh, that lives. is not just a, but it is a still life, isn't it? It is. Well, it's a still life of a piece of toast and a cup of coffee. Yeah, which is which I guess yeah. is, is, is relevant. But that was just a snapshot. The uh, well, uh, the 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 ones that I was putting in for the still life were the ones of the flowers. But let me continue. Up. That is yeah, the, move, move that's up. not a still that life. That is not a still life. That is not that's a still, not still life. life. No. So no. that's not a still life. No, no, these no. were just all street photos from the other that's day. To show you there, we ah, there we go. Getting close. Getting that close. is the, okay, this is much, much closer to the to the like original definition uh of, of still life. Flowers. But but I would say this is not a still life because it doesn't <laughs> contain the context in which Formal and classic still lifes have been photographed. In other well, words, you see the context. You see the tabletop, or but we've uh, but we've, we've already Jeremiah, widened what, what the definition. What I would say is that I'm, I'm unburdened by education. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, the, say no more. <laughs> I, so, so I, I am both unburdened by education, um, and I am also constrained by the fact that I know nothing about still life. Um, so uh, that's so it, it's so in that sense, it's been fun, right, for me because I'm like, oh, okay, I sort of I could picture a still life, right? It'll, there'll be a, a painting, and there'll be a tall thing, and there'll be some good lighting, and there'll be some grapes, and there'll be some. Yeah, you know, De- depends. Depends on depends on how how tight you wanna wanna tie that de- definition. Um, right. If if you want to have a really tight definition, it's got to be a fruit basket yes. and a dead animal in there. And a dead, so, oh, got, definitely got to have a dead. Yeah. So sorry, I haven't got a dead animal or any food. I suppose you could eat the flowers, but I'm not sure they'd be very tasty. So I, <laughs> so so un- as I say, unburdened as I am by education or any experience in shooting still life, I thought, what can I do? And I thought, you know what? Um, uh, is is a, a good friend of somebody in need in photography it is the old uh, yeah, artistic uh, technique of chiaroscuro or chiaroscuro i forget how it's pronounced chiaroscuro so i thought do you know what i've got this uh, there's some amazing winter light in the house at the moment you know the sun very low very warm and it's sort of you know it, and i could just get shafts of it and sort of you know and and you know see how I can play with the light on the flowers and move the flowers around to catch light and get different shots. So that that's kind of what, what I was doing. And some of them came out like this one that you're seeing here. I really love the colours in this one, but it's absolutely chaotic and there's no clear subject. So I'm not sure whether I like this photo or whether I don't like this photo, but one Maybe thing I can needs- say is that it makes it makes it's very difficult for me to look at it because it is so. Um, uh, <laughs> I don't. Really, that, that that might help. I think, actually, that's I think not, it works in a right. rotated <laughs> fashion. So for the listeners, Chris genius, has just spun it by photo. ninety degrees, but, um, <laughs> which actually possibly makes it more coherent than it was. Um, so that's an interesting <laughs> technique you've got there, Chris. Um, uh, because when I was looking at it the way I shot it, I was like, I love this, but I don't love it because I can't even see. I can't even look at it. There's no clear subject. So this this last one then uh, was one that I was slightly happy with, not overly happy. Um, I like this one the best of the of the three. Yeah, I did. Oh, thank you. I did. I did too. It seemed to be the most coherent uh, shot. The, there was a. There seems to be a clear subject of it for me. You know, my eye was drawn to the same point. You know, the flower in the centre of the image. Uh, uh, every time I looked at it, my eye doesn't just sort of slide off it because of chaos. And so I thought, actually, do you know what? I've achieved some level of simplicity here that allows me to at least look at the photo. I'm not saying it's a good photo, but uh, I can at least well, see it. <laughs> you could make what? this very, very good if you masked the um, the green and just took it down and maybe. Uh, so the you know hazed it up a bit and popped the the color in front with the sharpness and blurred most you know the, I think the eye would go if bam I, to the center. So if I took a dozen sliders and pushed them all to the max, it might look a little bit better. <laughs> you never know. <laughs> I, I would say. No, just what, what what I like about it is that that uh, the focus is on on this petal in the middle Mm. um, because that's a sharp part of the photo and it's a bright contrasty part of the photo and then the way the light kind of uh, fades in on the top and on the sides it's it's almost like you're you're watching it through a slit in a in a 
like a, a slightly ajar door or something. It's like a, a mis- it has mystery, had mis- has mystery, and the light reveals it. And that's um, that's not the case with the other two photos that are, as you said, a bit more chaotic. So. Oh, there you go. Well, that so so that that that's that that then is my best contribution to to <laughs> this particular exercise. Although I confess, I didn't have a massive amount of time to get on and do that this week. So, uh, so so the the thing I did was I did not take new pictures. I went to my library and did the did the well chose chose a few pictures from uh, some some years ago. So, um. <laughs> I, I would I would like to say that this was a study of light and refraction of sunlight going through a vase of sorts. The reality of it is that I caught this like accidentally in a place that I was and the sun was out for like a minute and I saw this on the table and I just had to take the picture and then this was over. So it's, it's not set up, it's not planned, it's not... It was, it was just... Um, recognizing the light and I would, I would going for it. I would describe this as more of a near macro shot. It, yes, yes, it is. It's, it's, I, it's, it's, yeah. it doesn't, it doesn't fit the classic definition of still life no, for sure. Way, None thing, of mine do. <laughs> one of the things that we talked about, um, or we avoided uh, mentioning, really, is the compositional formalism that is uh, common to classic still lives. Oh, I learned most of my my compos- compository skills from still life. From putting things in relation to uh to each other, to the to the frame itself, to the uh to the ground things stand on. So um it was good a good training ground for sure. Um again, not a still life, more of a what is it? A landscape? Scarecrow. We're looking at a scarecrow, a funny-looking scarecrow, with a basket for a head. Um, it's kind of street photography without. The it street. is, yeah, it is. It's not a still life, uh, especially, especially as there's a lot of animate things in there, as yeah. like lots wind of grass and, and yeah. wind and stuff. Yeah, so not a still life. Is that a still life? We're no, looking at a, it's a sun, photograph. a sunflower, a sunflower with the sun. With the sun <clears throat> making shining through the uh, petals, I'm so. very strict uh, here. Uh, yes, yeah, so I can. I can tell. I can tell. <laughs> How about this? Macro, beautiful. Macro, macro very tasty. So piece um, of cabbage, um, great fractal cabbage, cabbage um, Romanesco cabbage. Yeah. Um, <laughs> not a still about life. As far from a still life. As is, is this real indeed. estate photography now? Is it? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's 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 a it's a, actually in a museum, um, and it's an it's a house. It's a, it's a room in a house from 1965 in it's Germany. It's a terrific photo, by the way. It tells you so mm, much. I really like this one as well. There. Yes, but it's not a still life. And last but not least, same house, an uh, in, inanimate bathroom from the 1970s. <laughs> if that was a miniature, I would consider giving you that. Okay, I give up. I give up. I give up. <laughs> let's let's look at some real still lives here. Uh, Jeremiah, you have picked up a brush and started painting. Of course, I did. In my mind, I did. Uh, this this is a very uh, classic form. You know, formal still life draws might so, be from old paintings. For those who are listening, we're looking at a table with grapes and a. A plate with a rabbit and a vase and tulips and uh, or in intricate ornaments on on vases and some weird shaped drinking vessel with a funny lid and um, some someone from let's say the seventeenth century showing off the things they own, yeah. uh, the beautiful you things they have and they can afford, and the draped background uh, yes. also. And brocaded silk or whatever. Uh, this uh, was <laughs> generated by uh, Mid Journey. Um, and Why am I not surprised? <laughs> by the way, it, it was and it was uh, generated over the course of maybe a week of of work. Not all, obviously, consistently, but it was. Give 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 us take us 
briefly take us through that process. So uh, what, what, what did you put in? You put a prompt in that says a no. still life from no, 1700. I never, I never started with a prompt. Okay. Um, I started by um, scouring basically art history in the 17th century of uh, mainly Flemish painters um, that really spoke to what I think early were or very early still lives. Yeah. And that which has lasted over the centuries. And I, I took one and, and another and then another and I, I blended them. Um, and then once, once I had the feeling of the blending, which looked very, very dissimilar to this, I then started to prompt with uh, sharper backgrounds, more specific foreground, uh, what kind of light, window light, north, um, low. So the, the, the very iterative process. Yes, um, and, and it I would just go through micro uh, movements. I used, for those of you who are into this kind of work, uh, seed seeds to keep things similar um, and without going into how that's done. And then I started to use the arguments or the fine adjustments in terms of negative prompting and... And giving on individual and on and on. tokens different weights and that kind of stuff. Yes, um, yeah. and and so uh, taken through the process, probably a hundred images to get to this image. And you did all this for our podcast. Yeah, you could have painted it quicker than that. <laughs> no, that's a leading question. I, I am working on uh, my next uh, gallery <laughs> show is going to be a show uh, there we of go. generated still life. So I thought I would just. I'd show this one because this will be in the show. Uh, some of the others I've chosen are, are not because they were iterative, iterative uh, experiments along the way. Um, but I often start with my own photo uh, and uh, another, or a combination of my photos or even a texture, a background, um, the way light works, and combine them and then start to prompt. Um, I'm very, you know, I, I want to be very careful of never mentioning another artist in the work. Yes. That, that's something that I, I don't do. And so... Um, and then if you, if you have enough, enough uh, of your own art created, then you can st train the AI on your own art, and then you can mention your own name as the artist. <laughs> <laughs> so, so just to make sure, just to, so everybody understands that, I think what you're saying there, Jeremiah, is you don't write a prompt that says something like, in the style of Vermeer. No, yeah. I, I guess you can do that. I don't. No, but you don't. Is what I'm saying. No, because yeah, it's, I, 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 I it, want it to be something that comes out of my own relationship mm -hmm. with the machine. I th yes, that, that's the interesting exploration. That's also one of the main ethical uh, points of criticism right now: um, the 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 using of other people's styles as opposed to. Um, building it from the ground up yourself. Yeah, though, though, though I do not do that, um, I object to that criticism because style, as we know, style or technique is not something that is copyright written. Yeah. You can't, and, and one could go through um, a collection of 500, even a thousand years of art and draw links you know, every few years to common techniques and aesthetics. And does that mean that the ones that came after are irrelevant? Well, it, it's not true. Probably uh, not. In yeah. terms of, you know, uh, what's his name? Greg Rutowski, whose <laughs> work is... One of the most famous uh, styles used. Uh, prompting, yeah. mm -hmm. yes. Uh, I, under I understand the, you know, the frustration there. But there is one way for artists to kind of avoid that and that's to eliminate all their work um, and tags of their work from um, the cloud and media and social media and museums and just totally eliminate that um, work from the world uh, and keep it in your house. Um, you know, you have, and, and that will work. No one will prompt a view, and, and you know, that's a way to do it. Of course, 
in a hundred years, your work will probably be completely forgotten <laughs> because there will be no way of researching that. But if you are taking that moral high ground, that is the decision you're going to make. You're either in the world and you have to accept the influences of style, not talking about copying because copying is different and, and AI does not copy. Um, machines don't understand what that is. They don't hold images. They just go through them and analyze the, the dust of it, as it were. So, um, there, you know, that's where we stand in AI. This is all going to be, this is so new, it's all going to be evolving. Oh, this, uh, this is changing by mass. the day, pretty much, yeah. Yeah, but, but I have a personal, you know, obviously... Uh, right. Thoughts with that. Anyway, here's here's another one. <laughs> now, one of the things that I really am uh, very proud of myself is getting the bird on the label of the bottle. Um, this is a classic composed still life. There's a couple of bottles. I'll have to I'll have to zoom in here and take yeah. a look around. So we have a bird, we have a bottle with that bird on the label of the <laughs> bottle. Then we have something in another glass bottle that. It, it it looks like similar to that bird. <laughs> yeah. Looks like a little half melted version of that yeah, bird. It, yeah. Then there's some writing and then there's some uh, whatever okay. that thing is. Some stuff. Stuff. And, 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 and one of the things that, that attracts me to doing this is is that a dead rodent in there? <laughs> right. The, the, <laughs> the process of doing it up to a point where you're focused on the realities of a few objects to give the image yeah. the appearance on first blush as being absolutely real in a photo or a painting. But on closer... Um, <laughs> you go, what closer the heck is that? <laughs> and closer investigation, the surreal aspect of that machine man... Um, Dysfunction becomes more, um, you know, it just becomes more evident. Now, I have tried to take some of these images into Dali and do some in-painting. I haven't spent enough time doing it, but, I, but Dali tends to create imagery that is a little more cartoony, illustrative, broad, not as subtle. That's what I found. I'm not saying it's better or worse. It's just a question of how it interpolates what the queries are. And so I could never get it quite to match, even when I took it back into Photoshop. And, and I, I do use Photoshop and Topaz um, also here. So I do masking and, and, and adjustment here. It's not just right out of the box. Um, so there there is... Um, <laughs> There's texturing and there's certainly a lot of sharpening too. So whose whose signature is that there on the right bottom? I don't know. I think it was a signature of a painter who painted something similar in the machine. It looks like a, it, it's a simulation of a signature. Yes, but pretty it, much it's, it's gibberish. But yes. but it again one of the things that it draws from is the history of these kinds of works. And obviously, when you go to the 17th century, um, they're all signed like that. And so did I steal this <laughs> from some unknown artist who signed it? No, but the machine certainly was influenced at some point in its investigation of an artist who may have used this the kind machine of light or... The machine has learned that that is a very popular location for squ squiggles that contrast with the background. That's true. Yeah. Here's one more. This is not AI. Different style. Well, okay, this... D different, different feeling. Uh, I chose this because this is a, a complete uh, connection to my pick. Um, it, it is a, a, there's a book I have it right here. Um, this is a very, very classic painting. This is a, I think, 1635, if I'm remembering this. And, and this is a still life with oyster and lemon. Uh, it's very, it's, it, it is one of the earliest and most classic um, paintings. 
that, that did influence many, many people out of the Flemish style. <clears throat> I thought I'd bring that up as in, in our quest to understand where this all comes mm -hmm. from. And uh, I did use this initially um, in my kind of a blending mode very early on. Mm, okay. Yeah, oysters, lemons, silverware. Yeah. That's a rich person <clears throat> who owns these things. And then, oh, now, now we, <laughs> now it gets more modern. Now we are looking at. Uh, oh, but by the way. Um, I forgot to mention, but of course, uh, there's a link in the show notes to our photo gallery, TFOP Photos, which uh, has these pictures in it. So, um, if you were wonder, if you were listening and wondering what we're talking about, um, check those out. So, this is a glass, well, glass vase bowl kind of thing, hybrid, like a fish with bowl, floating, like <laughs> floating. yeah, like. Like there a fish bowl. There is, there's no there water water is but there's it. no water in it. It's a floating. <clears throat> It's a floating fish and 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 flower petals or shells, marbles and stones marbles and, and flowers and this is this is weird. <laughs> this this was an accident. <laughs> <laughs> and anybody who works in AI generative in terms of imagery, accidents are the norm. <laughs> yes, accidents happen, and sometimes the accidents are bewilderingly beautiful. And I, I was quite captivated with this, and I think it it comes from the fact that the flower, the big flower, which hangs over the edge, really pulls you in, and then takes you to the fish, and then the yeah. surrounding colors. And the, this one, I did no work on. I just, I just thought it was. Uh, an interesting example of a failure that is somewhat fascinating. Well, it's only failure if you admit to it. Well, you meant it was to a do failure this. in that I it's didn't true. intend the image ah, to be. Don't be so honest. <laughs> 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 All right. Um, and then, oh no, there's one more. What's there's that? One more. There's this one, which we're was... looking at a bonsai kind of yeah, tree the... in, a, in a vase, in a. Yeah. Yeah, this one I'm quite happy with. Uh, not part of my um, show, but but also uh, just what I wanted to. I I was very specific in terms of uh, the, I guess the time of season that the leaves on this particular maple. I wanted a Japanese maple. I wanted it to be X number of years old. I forget what what I said, but it, you know probably. A hundred years old. Um, I want it to be balanced, formal, symmetrical. Um, you can see some leaves falling because it's fall. Um, and so this was highly prompted and adjusted and changed. And I added a little bit of warmth in Lightroom in this case. Uh, but, you know, it's a nice... Image. But this this is this is and this is a tree that could be existing like that. Yes. This is very yes. realistic. Totally. All right. And then last um, but not least, a piece of coal. Yes. Now, I'm not sure you you're getting the <laughs> the quality of this, but this is this is taken with a 4x5 um No, camera. this is this is some somewhat reduced in quality. Yeah, I did too. Unfortunately. Put it, Put it up. It's a massive file. <laughs> it was, it was designed to be like you know six feet by four feet. So it's it's quite a big um, scaled image. I had to just drop it into seventy two. So. It is sixteen kilobytes in size. <laughs> oh, I, I, I guess I overdid it. Four hundred and forty four hundred and thirty two <laughs> times three thirty eight pixels. So we are not able to bask in the full glory of it I, I, I apologize and maybe next week i'll i'll, I'll get something that's a so, closer to 500k <laughs> but 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 jeremiah now now you put us in our places because we did not really do proper still lives but this is not a proper still life either no it's not and has uh, no context I, I i put it in just to generate that conversation because this is more <laughs> akin to tabletop photography Right, just the no table in it recording. There's not even a table. See, I have to say, though, if this is if this is a real piece of coal, it's probably got a dead animal and some grapes in it. So it probably <laughs> probably. 
<laughs> yeah, it's two pieces of Japanese a, coal. And, it's a meta uh, it, still life. It is very beautiful um, because w given the kind of high quality of it in terms of uh, capture, you can see all of the little sparkles of the black and the intricate details of it. And that's why it's meant to be enlarged very big until it starts to uh, break down. So, so you wanna you don't want to do a Gursky kind of thing? Yeah, it's it, you know, yes. That you can that you can rub your nose on and still see all the detail without getting it black. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm not gonna rub my nose on a lump of coal. <laughs> I look silly. <laughs> not yet. Well, but, uh, but what I mean is, but, but this is this is the impulse with these kind of pictures in a museum. That I want to get really close and see how far they pushed it. Yeah. So yeah, that would be one of those. That, that, that's that's it. Wonderful. So, so there we go. So again, I think I think the lesson really is that you know if you're stuck at home with a camera and have a little lights and some everyday imagery, you could just kind of create something that is special and really kind of create a discipline for oneself that helps you understand the relationship between light, objects, reflectivity, composition color and how to take it through to a really um, exquisite image with very commonplace items because many of these still eyes were just like Chris said just what people had around and if you if you want to be able to if, if you want to get uh, Jeremiah's approval for your still eyes <laughs> then make sure We're, you read up on what a still life is up front yeah and we'll create a filter system that you just put your <laughs> You, re you upload your image, it'll give you a red... Yes, a yes or no. Line yeah. Yes or no. An a AI that... Did, we need so, an AI that, that does, a, does a still life thumbs up, well, thumbs down yeah, kind I of thing. I have a challenge for that, though, actually. I would say, you know, because for me, part of this exercise has been, in a good, in a good way, it's been a technical exercise, mm. right? So it's, you know, because it's... It constrains you. You can't go out and do the most exciting thing in the world, or yeah, you can't. You you can't go and you know shoot penguins in a in their natural habitat, you know, for an exercise like this, can you? You have you have to you have to do something you know that is a little bit more um, constrained. So I quite enjoyed the you know, the technical aspects of it, the, of what I was doing, you know, moving things around to catch the light because I was using the sun as my light source. So I had to move the subject rather than the light source. And I quite liked the, the the technical nature of it and taking. I mean, I've shared three shots, right? But there were, you know, there are many more than that that I took, um, and I quite enjoyed that. So I'm not sure that I, I think if I think of still life in terms of a technical exercise rather than a compositional standard, I I think. I, I think I did all right. <laughs> I think I did shoot still lives, even though there were no tables or dead animals or grapes. I have a question for both of you is in creating, and I think I, this is a rhetorical question, but in creating the discipline of rules, constraints, whether they be lighting or um, aesthetically composed pieces, whether it's a square or three to two or 16 by nine, whatever. But when you create those constraints, does that then free you to explore so much more within those constraints because you there's decisions that are taken off the table? For example, if you're shooting with a 120 Hasselblad, you know, CM, your constraint is you have to compose for a square. I mean, that's really what it is. Um, if you have a candle as your only source of light at night, that's a constraint. And then you start to think, well, what can I do with a candle light and a square format here in my... I, know, I mm -hmm. my it's an hobble. interesting question. For me personally, I have to say I find aspect ratio as a cons using aspect ratio as a constraint to be not a particularly positive thing. I think other constraints, yes. So, for example, you know, uh, black, black and white as opposed to color, or or or, or vice versa. You know, a, a particular color or a, you know. But I think I, I I struggle sometimes with aspect ratio as a creative constraint. Um, because Can sometimes I then I just get to see. Back at you then? Yeah. So I think I, I think generally speaking, I agree with you in principle that constraints 
promote creativity, but that particular one I would challenge. If you are close to high mountains and you compose <laughs> anamorphically, you have a problem. Um, yes. So the liberation is if you shoot square, the mountain then will peak at the right distance from the lens. If you're shooting wide or even three to two, often the top of the mountain will have to be clipped. I see Unless that. you move very but you, far But you can away. also do that by shooting with a wider angle lens so that the, the mountain in the distance will be smaller. So that, that's, you, uh, yeah, that's you dealing with a constraint. <laughs> it is. Um, uh, yeah, I okay, yeah, fair point, fair point. I think, I think one, one of the difficulties today, and that is probably hard to understand for especially younger people, um, is that we do live in a time where we do not have many constraints where we have a lot of things. So we're not dealing with three things that we put in a picture, but if you look around, there's a hundred things. And uh, so I have to make a choice. And um, so my, my rhetorical answer to your rhetorical question is <laughs> yes. For me, uh, constraints are uh, the bringer of creativity. Me too. Mm. So we have too many things and we can do too many things. I have... I have access to eight, nine, ten different cameras here, and uh, each of them is a different beast and does different things better. So I, yeah. So anyway, um, how about looking? Oh yeah, what does that mean for the future of photography? Well, picks of the week. <laughs> so uh, still life, still life will be around, and we get we go on to the picks of the week. Jeremiah, you brought us a book. Well, I did. I brought this very book. Still Life with Oysters and Lemons, written by a wonderful poet. and Mark um, Doty. Yeah, it's a, it's a wonderful book to kind of take a, a dive in a more... It's poetic. a book on still life. It's on still life. It comes from this particular image that I posted. And it's hi I highly recommend it for anybody uh, in the visual field. And that's the book, uh, the painting. On which that's the, the painting that starts. is the title of the book but it talks about more than just this one painting yeah it's, it's really the relationship between him and the still life all right um i brought a pic which is not related to well it is related to still life because you can take still lives with lenses i brought the weird lens museum Ooh. which um is a website of a guy and i'm I was wondering, did I already talk about this on this show? Because I talked about it everywhere so no. far, but I don't think I did here. Um, which is Mathieu Stern. He's a French guy from Paris, and he um, collects weird lenses. He has a and great YouTube are, channel as well. And he has a YouTube channel where he, about each of these lenses, here, you can see there's a whole lot of them here. Um, there's like the weird, the iceberg lens, which is a weirdly shaped lens, and he talks about it and shows what it does and uh, a lot of different other ones, some cobbled together himself, some here, some anamorphic stuff. Um, one he, okay, this is, <laughs> this is the weirdest one, the eyeball lens, which is uh, a 3D printed thing with a with a glass lens in it. Um, yeah, so that's, that's one to check out if you want to get uh, some inputs. What is the iceberg lens? Uh, the iceberg lens is a weird, weirdly shaped lens that let's let's just have a look here through it. So, um, he's oh he's doing actually doing making this out of actual of, ice of ice out of actual ice so it and keeps changing as you're using it. I like that. Um, so he yeah he, let, let's see yeah there there's there's some results from it. So um, yeah he's making icebergs into lenses that kind oh. of stuff it's weird stuff it's a, it's a beautiful little website and the youtube videos are a really nice um a really nice uh, addition to that so highly recommend it to peak your creativity <laughs> all right i think that brings us to the end of this episode still life do more still life make sure you 
Make sure you uh, <laughs> make sure you and make sure you make sure you follow the right recipe yes. here. <laughs> Absolutely, go get the yeah, the compositional template out and paint in the numbers and, and and be sure not to color outside the lines and stuff. <laughs> yeah, that's highly forbidden. But it's, it's still this. an interesting it's still been an interesting and fun exercise actually. So I've enjoyed it. Totally. So we are, of course, online at thefuturephotography.com. You can find all the other 200-something episodes there. Um, we'll be back next week with more. Uh, find us on the Twitters at TFOPNow. See you next week. Till then. Bye-bye. Bye. been listening to The Future of Photography. Subscribe to the show wherever you get your other podcasts. Find the show notes and more information at thefutureofphotography.com. Thank you.